Hello, thank you for joining us for How to Travel More and Better. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Colin Wright. Colin Wright has written a few dozen books, hosts a trio of podcasts, and speaks to audiences around the world on a variety of subjects. He started traveling full-time in 2009, living out of a carry-on bag while his readers voted which country he would move to next every four months. He's since visited more than 60 countries in all 48 contiguous United States at least three times apiece. He currently lives in Milwaukee, where he has a home base from which to travel. So without further ado, here's Colin Wright. Thank you so much for having me. I think I remembered to take off mute this time, so we're already moving forward in that regard. Uh, I wanted to open up by saying a huge thanks to everybody involved in this talk and getting it all set up. This sounds like just a really cool program for people. And to celebrate libraries real quick, libraries are some of my favorite institutions, favorite things, one of the best things to come out of the Industrial Revolution, arguably. Uh, I spent a lot of my childhood at libraries. I spent a lot of my adulthood at libraries around the world. My mother worked at a library for a long time, and the folks who work at libraries, who support libraries, are just some of the most wonderful people you'll ever meet, and they provide communities with the resources and spaces and everything that they need to actually be thriving communities, and for the people in those communities to be civically engaged and to continue to grow in a bunch of different ways. So wanted to open with that so you all know I am in the pocket of Big Library, a huge fan, always wonderful to be able to speak to a group of people who probably, like me, recognize that libraries are amazing. So that being said, that out of the way, I would like to talk to you today about travel. And to get started with that, let me share my screen here. I've got a simple little thing. Hopefully that shared the way it's supposed to. Um, let me start by talking to you a bit about my relationship with travel and my evolving relationship with travel. Uh, let me shift a couple of windows here real quick. There we go. Okay. So my name is Colin Wright. You can see a bit about what I'm about at my website there, colin.io, uh, but you'll learn a fair bit about me during this presentation as well. And what I'd like to talk to you about in general, once I speak about a bit about my relationship with travel and how that's evolved over the years, is the conceptualization, the normalization, and the resourceization. Uh, I'll share some resources about travel and how we might then incorporate travel into our lives and more tightly interweave it so that it's not a disruptive thing. It's not something that is rare or unusual. It's something that can play whatever role we want it to play in our lives and that we can then reshape it so it's more us-shaped over time as well. Now, my origin story in terms of travel is actually perfect for this particular presentation because it orients around a relatively small trip, something that was very common, something that was inexpensive. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. I was running a branding studio and living a pretty good life. I had a lot of the goals that I had set when I was in school. I had accomplished a lot of those. I had some cool clients that I really liked working with. I had a good relationship with other people in my space, a pretty good reputation in that space. I was making a lot more money than I'd ever made in my life and more than I thought I would make in my life. Having grown up in the Midwest, the, the figures expand quite substantially and rapidly when you move out to the coast, especially a place like LA. But I found myself in a situation where, although a lot of things were wonderful with my professional situation, they weren't really great with other aspects of my life. My health was suffering. I barely slept. My anxiety levels were through the roof. I just did not want to let any of my clients down. The numbers involved were so large that everything was very stressful. I was a big ball of stress 24-7. My health was suffering as a consequence, my relationships were suffering, and I did not have anything that you could even graciously call hobbies. I, I simply did not have time for anything with the number of hours I was working and the amount of psychological weight 
the cumbersomeness of all of the things I was juggling day in and day out were just so hefty that I didn't have time for a life outside of my work life. And so it was fortunate that I had on my 24th birthday, the opportunity to take a little road trip, the first vacation that I had had in my adult life, because I had started my first business when I was in school and now I was running this studio, had zero time, zero minutes to spend on anything non-work related. I was able to take this little trip, drive out to Arizona, go to the Grand Canyon, which is a lovely place. If you've never been before, it looks fake. Um, even when you're standing right there next to it, you might be completely convinced it's a movie set. It's a backdrop for a film. Uh, I had the opportunity to take this trip, this little tiny road trip, only a couple of days, but establishing that distance between myself and my typical life, the things that I was doing day in and day out, my workaday life, all of my habits and rituals and routines, I had the opportunity to see things in the big picture for the first time in a very long time. I had that arm's length distance between myself and the way that I typically do things. And that allowed me to recognize, one, this is not sustainable. The way that I was doing things was not something that I could keep doing, not if I wanted to live to the ripe old age of 38, where I am now. Uh, it wasn't something I could keep doing in that way. I had to change something about my life if I wanted to keep moving forward and especially growing as a person. Uh, but I also realized that I had set aside a whole lot of my supposed priorities, uh, one of them being that I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to go out and see things and challenge my assumptions and perceptions and meet new people and have new experiences. I wanted to look at things from different angles so I could three-dimensionalize my view of things, uh, three-dimensionalize my view of myself, of other people, of the world that I was living in. And this was something I told myself was very important. This was the supposed reason I was working so hard to earn all this money because my perception, having grown up in the Midwest, where as anybody who has lived in the Midwest knows, it's very expensive to travel anywhere. <laughs> Simply flying to other parts of the United States from Missouri, it usually would cost more than it cost me to fly to Asia or Europe from California. It's just very expensive. So my perception of travel was that it was an expensive, rare sort of thing, and I wanted to do it regularly. So in my mind, I needed approximately infinite dollars in order to attain this goal of mine. Well, sitting there next to the Grand Canyon, having that big picture moment, that God's eye view of things for the first time in a very long time, I realized that maybe I could actually start acting on that now. And if I dramatically reduced my expenses, if I paid off all of my debt with the money that I'd made on a lot of the client projects I'd done recently, I could winnow things down and then focus on travel the way that I wanted to do travel. I could start today, basically. I could do it in that moment. I didn't do it in that moment. I gave myself four months. And during that four month period, I got rid of everything that I owned that didn't fit into a carry-on bag which itself was a full-time job because I had accumulated just a stupid number of things that I absolutely did not need. Uh, and I figured out where I would go. And that was a big issue for me because up until that point, I had never left the country. I hadn't even traveled much within the country, but I definitely had not left the United States. I'd only recently acquired my passport and it was completely empty at this point. So I started a little blog called Exile Lifestyle. I intended to write about what I was doing and what I was learning and use it as an excuse to reach out to people so I could learn how to travel better and to learn about the places that I wanted to go. And I put up a little poll and said, hey, where should I go? And I asked people which country I should move to. And that then set the tone for what I ended up doing next, moving to a new country every four months or so based on the area I was going to, uh, based on the votes of my readers. My readers told me where to go. I went to these places. I lived in these places as much like a local as was feasible. And that then shaped my experience for the next better part of a decade. Now, in traveling to all of these places, I was able to live a huge variety of different 
lives. Uh, there were some points where I was more peripatetic and moving from place to place to place. In some cases, I was leaving, living in a beachside bungalow. In others, I was living, you know, in an old brownstone. Sometimes I was living in very remote rural areas, sometimes very urban, sometimes walkable, sometimes not. It was a huge variety of different places that allowed me to fill in a lot of those blanks. And I went to touristy places like Paris. I went to far out of the way places like uh, this is a photo of Mayuyao, which is a an agrarian society uh, in the Philippines. And it's located about three and a half hours drive from anything. There are only homes there. Everybody eats what they can make in the rice terraces. So lots of rice, lots of little tiny shrimp that live inside the rice terraces and no banks, no hospitals, no restaurants, no stores, nothing there. Very, very different from living in Paris. I was able to soak up a whole lot of these different cultures and lifestyles. I was able to see different versions of myself, who I was in these different settings. I was able to meet just an incredible abundance of different people who have lived very different lives than I have. And each and every one of these experiences and encounters was enriching because it allowed me to add to myself and my perception of myself, but then also challenge everything that I thought I knew uh, about myself, about other people, about the world, about my beliefs, about my understandings and my goals, absolutely everything. And that to me is part of the value of travel is that in moving around, even if you're just hopping on a train or a bus or jumping in a car and taking a road trip somewhere, you are able to expand your horizons in a very dramatic and substantial way that then has concrete effects on the rest of your life. Every single thing that you do, you take home with you in some way, even if it's just in a tiny little way, even if in a way that's subconscious and you don't realize it till later, that experience then informs everything else that you do from that point in the future. Now in, what was it, 2018, I started to mix up my model a little bit. I write books for a living primarily these days. Very fortunate to get to do that. I am absolutely passionate about it. The book industry is an interesting creature though, and part of what you need to do typically, especially as an independent author like me, you have to go on a lot of road trips and go on book tours and sign books and shake hands and give talks. It's, it's an absolutely wonderful experience if you're into travel the way that I am. One of these recent trips, the most recent one, I did a 50 city tour across the United States and Canada. And I decided to mix up part of it rather than just traveling in a car or taking mass transit the way that I typically do. I ended up buying a 33 foot holiday Rambler Imperial motorhome from 1985. I had never set foot in an RV before and I thought it might be interesting to give myself the excuse to learn something about motorhomes. It, it was astonishing that it went as well as it did. I found this thing cheap, ended up scooping it up, did some repairs on it. YouTube is miraculous for this sort of thing. Uh, did a whole lot of plumbing repairs that that went so-so. You know, YouTube can only do so much if your plumbing skills are not there to begin with. But I was able to then travel around in this different way. And most of my past handful of years have been different experiments of this kind, trying to challenge myself to, th to see things, to to garner all those new experiences and perspectives, but to do it from different angles, to try to see the spaces in between places, to try to see areas like RV parks, which otherwise I wouldn't have any reason to go to or even know about. Now I am acutely aware of the different sorts of cultures and regions and places that exist in that corner of the United States and Canada in this case. Now, Shortly after that last trip, part of why that's notable for me is that shortly after that trip, like many people, I had to set my passport aside for a little while. I was visiting my parents. At the time, I was living in London with my then girlfriend. I visited my parents in Missouri right before COVID hit. And that then, of course, brought a sudden long pause into my life. I transitioned into a completely different way of living for a while because it was not safe in most cases, in some cases also not legal to travel the way that I'd been traveling before. But I also decided during this long pause, because a pause can be valuable too. It can be different if you're accustomed to moving around rapidly and seeing a bunch of different things all at once. 
being forced to stay in one place for a while, that can be a novelty. And while staying in this one place for a while, I had the opportunity to think about things. And I decided that my next step, rather than taking a train somewhere or hopping on a flight to a remote part of the Philippines or buying up an RV and doing my best to fix it up in full time in that thing for a while. Instead of that, I would do something that absolutely terrified me and I would hold still. And I would not hold still in the sense that I literally wouldn't go anywhere, but what I wanted was a home base. I thought it would be an absolutely staggering undertaking that absolutely did terrify me, to buy furniture and to receive mail every single day. And I say that because at this point, I was in my 30s. The last time I bought furniture, I was 24 years old, and I'd seen and done all of these things in between. I did not know who I was in that context anymore. I didn't know who I was as a consistent neighbor to people for longer than four months. I didn't know who I was if I was able to set up a space custom for me, based entirely on what I wanted, rather than trying to figure out how I could reshape myself to fit into other spaces. I didn't know what that space would look like. I didn't know what that lifestyle would look like. And I was a little bit afraid that I would lose something of myself, that I would have in between become only travel guy. And without the travel, I wouldn't know who I was and I would be empty and vacant and just a husk of my former self. So I wanted to try this. I wanted to make sure that I was okay holding still as well, and that I could continue to grow and continue to make things that I thought was important and experience that side of my life with these fresh eyes. Now, for a variety of reasons, I decided to settle in and hunker down in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is an absolutely beautiful place if you've never been here before. It's great for the beer lovers. It's great for sports lovers. I like it because there's lots of green spaces and the public transit is pretty good. And there's a lot of people in my neighborhood in particular that own dogs. And I, I don't want to own a dog. I want a lot of people with dogs to be around me so I can just walk outside and always stand a pretty good chance of finding a dog I can pet. Lots of stuff like that that are lovely about Milwaukee. I live with my girlfriend here also. That's a, a pretty lovely attribute of the city as well, in my unbiased opinion. Uh, and being here has given me the opportunity to invest in a lot of stuff that's been difficult from the road, including things like living with my partner. But also, I've, I've always wanted to cook. And about six years ago, I think, I learned how to cook. I started baking and making traditional bowls, and I play a lot of music when I'm able to, but... It's not easy traveling with a guitar and other accoutrements that are necessary for that sort of thing. So it's given me the opportunity to double down on that aspect of my life. It's also given me the excuse to do more of different sorts of travel. And I've worked to travel across the United States in particular and taking road trips and other kind of low... Um, not low effort, I guess low investment in terms of money and time travel into my life as well, including things like getting to see corners of the United States most people don't go to. And one of my favorite things to do is to take a road trip and then just find the most bizarre roadside attractions I can possibly find and check those off my list as I go through and tell people about them. They usually don't believe me, but these things exist and they are magnificent. I've also had the opportunity, and I've always made the time to visit family, even when I was traveling overseas regularly, but now that I've been in country and within a couple of time zones rather than a dozen time zones away, I've been able to more regularly visit all my niece and my nephew, all my brothers and sisters, my parents, and all of my fur nieces and nephews, of which there are a great many. So that's been wonderful. Now let's talk about travel as a concept, I mentioned a few things there waxing poetic about my own relationship with travel, but some of the main things that I try to convey to people when they ask me about travel are thus. First, we all travel for different reasons. It is not just one thing that we travel for. Not everybody's trying to get the same thing out of the experience. All reasons are valid. Anybody who tries to tell you that you're traveling for a stupid reason, you want to go see roadside attractions, that's silly. No, that's, that's them trying to push their own ideas of what travel is on you. All possible justifications and reasons for travel are okay. I know people who travel for food. 
I have a good friend named Jody, actually, when she was traveling full time, she traveled exclusively for soup. She loves soup and she traveled the world, went to all these different countries, just trying to taste the most succulent soup she could find. That's her passion. Uh, I know other people who travel to see the architecture and to study it and to bring that back into their own practice. I know people who travel to have spiritual experiences. Uh, for a lot of people, that might mean like awe-inducing experiences, of which there are a great many. For them, it's a it's a more religious, spiritual significance where they travel to religious sites around the world and then feel things and then incorporate that into their larger body of beliefs and the way that they see the world and themselves, themselves as a spiritual creature. I know people who travel to hike and climb mountains, uh, producers who want to shoot videos, who want to take photographs. There is no wrong or right way. There's no inherently better or worse way. If you want to travel just to take Instagram photos, cool. If that is what really fills you with joy, that is perfectly legitimate. If you want to travel to have spiritual experiences to increase your capacity to have such things in the future, that is great also. We also have a huge number of assumptions about travel. And in particular, the one, I usually bring this up because most people, especially people who haven't traveled a whole lot, have a sense of travel that is oriented around what the travel and tourism industry has told them it is or should be. And what that typically means in practice is that it's expensive and it's celebrated and branded and marketed as this thing that's like a once in a lifetime experience. Travel should be your honeymoon. Even if it's not your honeymoon, it should feel like your honeymoon. And it must be life-changing. It must, must be self-defining. You must come back with stories about how it changed everything in your life. And that is simply not the case. It needn't be the case. It can be. Some travel absolutely is all of those things, including expensive, but it need not be. Travel doesn't have to be expensive. Travel can be casual. It can be off the cuff. And if anybody tries to tell you otherwise, they are probably trying to, to sell you something. You can travel for free. You can travel for very little money. And all of these different options, every shape and size and purpose is absolutely legitimate. And then I also try to imbue in people the idea that travel is valuable and it's valuable for different reasons and it can be woven into our lives so we can drive more of that value more frequently. It doesn't have to be luxurious. It doesn't have to be thrilling. It doesn't even have to be far away. Simply traveling to someplace nearby can give you many of the same benefits as traveling overseas. It still changes us. It still increases our perspective. It still gives us additional context about the world and about ourselves. And we can travel more if we are intentional about it. Now let's talk about some of the benefits of travel. I've gestured at some of these already. The exposure to novelty is great. It expands our sense of what's going on in the world, of the different sorts of beliefs and people and backgrounds, all the potential everythings that exist in the world become a little bit more visual, uh, visible or bare minimum thinkable if we have more of these things in our mental catalog that we've experienced at some point in life. Uh, our sense of the possibilities also increases because we have a larger range of things to derive new ideas from. Travel can also be routine breaking. And I mentioned this at the beginning with my little origin story, breaking away from my routine allowed me to dramatically change my perspective on things. And it wasn't just because the Grand Canyon's great. It really is pretty cool. You know, even if you think it's going to be cool going in, it looks cooler when you get there than you think it's going to be. But you could go anywhere. Any place new breaks you free of your brain's laziness patterns. Our brains are very, very lazy. They're trying to be lazy in order to save energy because the ancestors, human ancestors way back in the day that saved energy for a burst of running, sprinting away from a saber-toothed tiger, those were the ones that survived. And so our brains using something like 20% of all of the energy our bodies use, they try to save energy whenever they can going into a sort of low power mode. And that low power mode is enabled by using what are called heuristics. 
mental frameworks of the world and shortcuts based on those mental frameworks, those simplified versions of what the world is and what we do within that world. And this is the reason that if you drive back and forth, take the same commute to work every day, sometimes you might just like wake up in the parking lot at work and you don't know how you got there. You don't remember taking that last turn into the parking lot. Somehow you made it there. You were fully conscious during the entire process of getting to work, but your memory doesn't tuck it away because it's lazy. It doesn't care. It's done this a million times before. Traveling breaks you out of this by exposing you to an intense amount of novelty. And this is the reason that when you travel to a new place, especially a foreign country, but it doesn't have to be a foreign country, your first day there in particular will just be a wash with sensory information. It will be overwhelming almost always. The sights and sounds, the smells, the colors, everything's brighter and more intense because your brain is turning on full blast using all of the energy it possibly can because this new context that it is suddenly in is full of threats and potential opportunities. And introducing ourselves to spaces with unfamiliar threats and opportunities is part of what pulls us from this heuristics-based, reflexive, and routine existence. There's nothing at all wrong with having routine and reflexes and rituals. That's something that I enjoy about having a home base here in, Mil here in Milwaukee. But to break out of it periodically is important because that helps us then inform what we do with those heuristics, with those routines and rituals. That's what brings fresh meat into the situation. And we want to be able to do that periodically, if nothing else, so that we can continue to grow these things and expand them in a way that makes sense for who we are today. Travel is also context expanding. It helps us fill in the blanks in our understandings of the world. It helps us fill in gaps that we didn't even realize were there. It helps us understand things that we might otherwise take in just as theoretical information. Understandings about a different country that you've lived in will be very different. The news items arriving on your screen or in your paper will look very different if you've lived in a place compared to never having been to a place. If you've been there, you have more reason to care. You might know people there. You know the street that you would walk down to go get your coffee each morning. Suddenly you have a stake in the world that you did not have before. And expanding our context in that way can be valuable to make us care more about more things and to give us that stake. But it can also give us a productive sense of humility because again, it expands our range, our understanding of what is possible, just how diverse and different and how spectacularly complex the world is, despite that intuitive sense that we understand things now, we get it and there's nothing left to learn. Normalizing travel is a drum that I try to beat regularly, because although it can be a lot of fun and still quite valuable to travel once a year, once every couple of years, do it on your honeymoon, do it on vacations, do it when somebody has a wedding, that is absolutely valuable and it's nothing to look down on. But normalizing it, at least in some way, allows us to do it more regularly and it allows us to engage in different shapes and sizes of travel as well. Uh, oops. <laughs> Making it casually accessible is something that allows us to work it into our lives without stressing out. It's something that allows us to build different types of travel into our existence, and it allows us to do different things. Rather than always going to a beach resort or taking a cruise, rather than always going to a place, staying in a hotel, attending the wedding, that sort of thing. It allows us to engage in different sorts of travel, expands, expands our sense of what travel can be. And it's something that allows us to then uh, incorporate different aspects of travel into our lives long term. My solution to this, the approach that I take to building travel into my life, now that I have a home base here in Milwaukee, and now that I'm not living out of carry-on bags, I, I own more stuff than carry-on bags. I own art on the walls. I have fancy microphone, things that would not fit in my bag that I'm now able to indulge in. Um, something that allows me to still travel despite not fully optimizing my life and orienting my life around travel is what I call mini vacations. And these are valuable and useful, I find, in part because 
they are like vacations. And that's in fact, one of the, my personal tenets for a mini vacation is that it should be relatively stress-free, that it should not be a burden or something that I'm worried about when I put it on my calendar or decide to schedule it ad hoc out of nowhere, it shouldn't be something that weighs on me or disrupts my life in a meaningful way. It should be something I look forward to, something that refills my battery rather than draining my battery. And so it should also be affordable because one of the most stressful things you can do is invest in something that is very expensive, whether we're talking about money or time or psychological energy that you would prefer to be spending on something else, having to then invest those things on something that you don't really care about, an experience, an adventure, uh, a commitment that you don't particularly care about, that can be draining. And many vacations are also, importantly, shorter term. And sometimes that means half a week, sometimes it's a long weekend, sometimes it's a day, and in some cases you can even do something like this in just a couple of hours. Many vacations can take you to a friend or your family's place. You can visit a nearby landmark. You can go to museums. I highly recommend going to museums. You can visit libraries too. Libraries are often quite beautiful and they're filled with lovely people and interesting things. Uh, but you can also just walk around a natural area. You can go to a park, you can visit a lighthouse, you can take a trip to a beach somewhere or take a trip to the woods somewhere. You can go to a sporting event and use that as an excuse to take a, a mini vacation surrounding that sporting event. You can go, as I mentioned before, to like weird highway destinations. We are fortunate in the United States to have just an abundance of both highways and weird stuff on our highways. Some of the gas stations themselves are worth visiting, but there's just pockmarked all throughout the country, just a boggling assemblage of strange stuff that somebody thought was worth building. And that's part of what's so much fun about it is checking these things out and learning something about the interesting minds that are behind these things. Uh, my parents actually, before they left, they live in Seattle now, but before they left Missouri, they made this a regular part of their schedule where each month they would take at least one trip to some place in Missouri that was named after a foreign city. And Missouri, like many places in the United States actually, has a whole lot of cities and towns named after foreign cities. So there is Kabul, there is London, there's Paris, Missouri. And so they would go to these places and then they kept a little free online blog, a little travel log about these places. And they treated it as if they were going to the great big cities, to these big tourist destinations. There's nothing in London, Missouri. It's basically just a sign in the middle of nowhere, but they were able to turn that into an adventure and quite the trip. And it was a very funny writing that they had about it as well, because they were setting aside this time, they were turning it into a project. They were making it something that they did together and it cost them essentially nothing, nothing more than paying for gas to put in the car to get to and from these places. So it was very low commitment, very low burden. And it was just silly enough that it really, it tickled their particular funny bone. It's also possible to make travel and make a mini vacation a component of something else that you're doing. You can look at that wedding that you've got on your calendar and say, okay, well, I'm going to that wedding. I've already got some of my lodging and some of the food and things like that paid for. While I'm there, I'm also going to do this little side adventure. I regularly get invited to go do things. Every once in a while, I get to go visit like a NASA facility or something like that. It's really, really fun. It's one of the main perks of doing what I do for a living. Uh, and then typically after I get invited to go do that sort of thing, I'll build a series of mini vacations around it because I want to turn it into a multiplicity of different events, not just a single event, because sometimes the single event can then start to weigh on you uh, or it'll be just a thing that you do and then you walk away from without having fully soaked up the true potential of visiting that new location because you're just going to a place that people a, a point a to point b sort of situation you're going to the hotel you're going to the event that you're scheduled to go to you ha have no excuse to visit anything else in between scheduling mini vacations can help you avoid that point a to point b sort of travel and help you see more of the spaces in between places so in summary with that, mini vacations, they are cheap, they are varied, they are versatile, they are low stakes, and as a consequence of those other attributes, they also tend to be travel normalizing. Because these are things that we can fit 
within any lifestyle. All of us can find some small amount of time to schedule a trip to some place we've never been before, whether it's on the other side of the planet or on the other side of the city that we live in. Simply visiting someplace new gives us many of the same benefits of traveling to a place where we actually need a visa and our passport. We can travel, take many vacations solo, which can be quite beneficial. It helps you get to know yourself. It forces you to be a little bit bored and a little bit lonely, which then forces you to go engage with other human beings. But you can also then travel with other people and have some strange little adventures. Some of those adventures may be boredom related, but some of those adventures based on the things that you're actually intending to experience, that can be great. And importantly, it does normalize travel. It allows you to weave these things into your everyday schedule each month, each couple of months, maybe each week. You can fit something like this onto your calendar and you can do so with the minimum amount of additional weight additional financial weight, additional responsibility, additional psychological weight. It takes very little time to do something like this. And that then might then make you more confident investing more time and energy and resources in other types of travel in the future. But even if not, just working this sort of thing into your regular routine is something that will dramatically expand your horizons compared to a life where you don't do the same. Now, Living in the world that we live in today uh, is actually remarkably chilled out and easy when it comes to travel resources, when it comes to tools that we might use to make travel easier. For comparison, when I started traveling full time in 2009, um, smartphones were new. <laughs> So we didn't really have things like Airbnb. We didn't have Ubers. We didn't have e-SIM cards. We didn't have the opportunity to necessarily have the internet or even cellular phone connections in a lot of the places I was going. So it took a whole lot more heavy lifting. You had to get a bit more experimental and there was a lot more risk, both in terms of just maintaining contact with people back home, but also in terms of just cutting the umbilical to the internet in general you could go for a long period of time unintentionally, not being able to connect with the world, and that would dramatically influence your capacity to stay in touch with loved ones or to stay in touch with work, potentially. Um, today, it's actually very, very easy in comparison. I used to have a whole list of different, very nitty-gritty resources for different aspects of travel. Most of them today, you can find built in to Google, um, I, I hate to say it because there's a lot of pros and cons to dealing with big tech with this sort of thing, but Google Maps is great for finding your way pretty much anywhere you might go on the planet, and Google Flights has become the absolute best resource for finding cheap flights. Uh, it's great for finding cheap flights to places that you know you want to go and then finding which date to leave and return. They'll even in some cases give you your money. They'll pay the difference if the price drops after you buy a ticket. Uh, between purchasing the ticket and the flight itself. It's magnificent. They basically scooped up a bunch of their competitors. So those competitors that I used to recommend are now owned by Google. Google Flights, just flights.google.com, tends to be the best resource for that sort of thing these days in terms of price and in terms of flexibility. Uh, the other one, though, that I like to recommend, and this one is not as well known, but to me, it's better in many ways. It doesn't have as many airlines in it, but Rome to Rio shows you a combination of different transportation options. And that's cool because in some cases you don't want to take just like a couple of planes to get from point A to point B. And you don't necessarily just want to take a bus or just take a train or just drive. In some cases, it will make more sense to drive to a neighboring town take a plane to another city, and then take a train from that city to the place that you want to go. Uh, that's, that's actually common if you want to find a cheap flight and transportation to parts of mainland Europe. Often, you can find relatively inexpensive flights from Boston or Atlanta, fly into Oslo, and then take a train, or in some cases a boat, to mainland, to the rest of the mainland Europe uh, from Oslo. Rome to Rio shows you that combination of options. And it's a great resource both for getting to places uh, with spending less money along the way, just on the transportation element of your travel, but it can also help you turn the travel component of your trip into the adventure, especially if you take a train. The, the ones in the US are decent. Uh, I'm trying to be generous here. I, I like Amtrak. 
they're not as great as trains in other parts of the world, but I like Amtrak personally, but the trains in Europe are really spectacular. So you'll go to some places where certain types of travel can be part of the adventure, can be truly enjoyable, can be strange and uncomfortable in an interesting way. Uh, I've, I've ridden on more than one chicken buses in my time, <laughs> slowly meandering through the middle of nowhere with chickens over here, goats over here. Um, that can be an experience as well. So the travel component can be fun. Google Flights tends to be the most straightforward option and leaving yourself flexible in terms of what days you you leave and come back is one of the better ways to save money there. But Rome to Rio is really great for giving you versatility in terms of your travel. There's other options too, if you're planning way in advance, sites like Airfare Watchdog and Going. If you sign up for them, they'll tend to tell you when deals pop up. Deals are hit and miss, and in a lot of cases, you can actually do better than the, the plan, pardon me, the planned marketing discounts that a lot of these companies do for their flights, their airline travel. You can do better than that if you're just flexible with when you go someplace, uh, or if you, you know, take a flight here and a train there, if you mix things up. Still, some people like to do that, and especially if you're planning way in advance, it can be fun to watch for a certain price point that you're waiting for before you click and actually pull the trigger on those tickets. Uh, and then if you are into travel hacking, I personally am not. A lot of travel hacking involves using specific types of credit cards and then playing with the points systems with airlines. I don't find that compelling at all. It's not interesting to me. A friend of mine, Nomadic Matt, uh, he loves it. That's one of his favorite aspects of travel. Uh, if you go to nomadicmat.com, you'll find a bunch of resources related to travel hacking. I have no patience for it. He has all the patience in the world for it. So if that's something that's interesting to you, setting up your finances in such a way that you accumulate rewards related to travel over time, that is an excellent resource for that. In terms of staying at the places you get to, uh, Hotwire and Hotel Tonight are surprisingly good. They, it's been hit and miss over the years, but these are the types of sites where they don't necessarily tell you what hotel you're going to be getting, but they tell you it's three stars or four stars. It's located in a certain district in the city you're going to, and you can sometimes save a pretty decent amount of money on Hotwire and Hotel Tonight if you open up those apps and check when you arrive in a place or if you try to schedule a hotel within 24 or 48 hours of when you're actually going to be needing it. Airbnb has become worse over the years. It's still good, especially if you're traveling solo and you're just looking to like rent a bed for the night and then you're moving on the next morning, something like that. It's still pretty competitive and you can find places in the actual part of town that you want to be in. Otherwise, it's becoming quite spendy and there's a lot of hidden fees added onto that. Verbo is kind of the same thing, but usually for more vacation-y destinations, but it's worth checking both of those if you want. Um, a niche sort of residence that in an area where there aren't really hotels. Booking.com is becoming better at this because basically a whole bunch of hotel chains bought up some startups that allowed them to compete with Airbnb. So booking is kind of a combination of Airbnb-like residences alongside hotel rooms, often decently discounted hotel rooms. I've personally found myself using Booking.com a bit more than Airbnb of late, but that will probably continue to ebb and flow. And it'll definitely depend on which part of the world you're going to as well. So it's worth checking out all of them, potentially, and then over time you'll get a sense of which ones you prefer. You can also do something like couch surfing if you're feeling brave. Uh, there is a, a couch surfing company, I think, maybe just an organization that has an app called Couchsurfing. There's some alternatives to that as well. I, I can't speak to those. I haven't used those before. I've met some interesting people through Couchsurfing. The idea is that you set up an account if you have a couch or a spare bedroom. People traveling through the area can come stay there for free. It's for people who have extra space, who like to meet people from around the world. So it can actually be a fun way to travel, even if you're not traveling, if you don't mind inviting people into your home in this way. But then you can also benefit in return going out into the world and meeting some of these people. And I've met some absolutely incredible people through couch surfing, both through the app and just couch surfing on the couches of friends, of friends and family, that sort of thing. Uh, and then also, if you're feeling it, there's always the option, especially outside the U.S., there's more hostels now than there used to be. But this is particularly big 
in non-US, non-North American really, uh, countries. Staying in hostels, you can stay in like a multi-person room where there's eight or 12 people and a bunch of bunk beds. Usually that's very inexpensive. And if you're comfortable with that, it's great. You won't necessarily sleep very well because there's going to be a lot of snoring and getting up to use the restroom. And every once in a while, somebody has a problem with somebody trying to steal their stuff. It's very, very rare, but it happens. You can also try something like woofing, though. And woofing stands for Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. And this is a collection of resources, the, the woofing website, www.net. Um, aggregates these opportunities where you can travel around the world and work on organic farms. And you're basically trading that labor on these organic farms for room and often board as well. So if you don't have anything specific that you want to do in a particular area, you just want to go someplace and you want to keep your, your expenses low, that could be an interesting way to do it. I've only done this once. It was a really cool experience. I met some very interesting people. It has a lot of the charms of hostels, except that you are being not paid to be there, but your expenses are dramatically lowered uh, by working at these organic farms. And they're typically run by very interesting people and filled with other woofers who are also quite interesting people from around the world. And then in terms of enjoying it there, um, Google Translate has become just incredibly powerful. It's it's ridiculously stupidly powerful these days to the point where it's almost like a babble fish level technology from Hitchhiker's Guide where you can just converse with other people back and forth in a couple of different languages. And it's, if you have a strong internet connection, at least we'll do it on the fly. Um, Mango Languages is also incredible. That's an alternative to Duolingo and Rosetta Stone and Babel-like services. A lot of libraries, including a lot of libraries out there, have this service for free. So this is one of the amazing things that libraries offer. If you are interested in using it, um, just an incredibly powerful thing and remarkable that it's available free of charge, especially if you've seen how expensive the comparable services can be. And then also, and this is something that's still new to me, I've only used it once, but it's a lot more convenient than arriving in a new country and then having to find yourself a SIM card and replacing your existing SIM card with it and going through all the back and forth trying to get your account set up and figuring out how to pay for the minutes and stuff that you're purchasing with that SIM card, you can acquire an eSIM if you have the right phone for it using a service called Eralo. Uh, and what that means in practice is that rather than a physical SIM card, you get like a virtual digital SIM card that you download, basically. Your phone knows what to do with it. And then what's fun is you get to keep your normal phone number while you're traveling. So you can continue to receive phone calls and stuff from back home, but then you can also operate locally using that eSIM, which is often relatively inexpensive and a heck of a lot easier than arriving at an airport in a place where you don't know anything and maybe don't speak the language, trying to figure out how to set up your phone. Ultimately, Travel should be U-shaped. It is something that should reflect you and your priorities and your values, the things that you care about. Ideally, we reframe travel. We take it back from all the people trying to earn money off of us as we travel. You know, they, they need to do that. That's their living. They're not evil for doing it. But that creates a sense of travel as something that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Travel can be whatever we want it to be. It can help us achieve all the things that we want it to achieve and nothing else. Do not be fooled by the very well-branded, well-marketed, very spendy communications and narratives of what travel has to be. That absolutely is not the case. And ideally what we do is we figure out what travel is to us, and then we optimize for that over time. And part of how we figure that out in the first place is engaging in a lot of different types of travel, experimenting, and then allowing that to inform what we do in the future, what we invest more of ourselves and our time and our energy and resources in. Then over time, we can home closer and closer in on something that is the ideal type of travel for us, what we want to get out of it, and how we want to live our lives with that as a vital component of our personal growth and of our sense of understanding and context when we look out into the world. Again, my name's Colin Wright. Um, please reach out to me if you have any questions about travel or absolutely anything else. If I can answer, I will try to answer you. I respond to every email I get. And I believe now we have some time for questions.
if I didn't go over. That is correct. Uh, Colin, your screen is frozen though. I'm not oh, sure. Goodness. Let me see here if I can move the sh thing I'm sharing here. That's okay. a very funny image of me though. I like that. Well, Colin's figuring that out. If you want to uh, type your question into the Q&A, if you haven't already, please feel free to do so now. Um, we've got a few minutes. Why can't I turn it off? Put my camera to sleep. So, Colin, I can shut your camera off, uh, but you'll have to turn it back on. So let, let me try this. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, and I will turn it back on. Let's see if this works. Oh. Oh, unable to start because the host has stopped it. There we there go. There we go. All right. <laughs> Living in the future. Welcome back. Um, okay, so we'll get into it. Uh, your first question is about the gear you use, both good and bad, um, while you were traveling full time. And if you have any essentials that you would advise fellow nomads to have on hand. Yeah, let's see. Well, as much as I hate to say it, smartphones are incredible tools. I know a lot of us use them for purposes that are not as incredible uh, and necessarily utility belt like. But when you're traveling, modern smartphones are great. They they replace so many of the gadgets I used. I used to carry around a little point and shoot camera in addition to a little Motorola Razor flip phone and countless other things that now I don't have to carry because of the phone in my pocket. So that is a very useful thing, especially if you develop a a symbiotic rather than parasitic relationship with it. A phone is marvelous. And then you can use a lot of the, the tools like Mango Languages uh, on your phone to continue to grow and learn and interact with people and even like entertain yourself as you travel. Um, it can keep entertainment cheap. Libby is just like one of my favorite apps on my phone. And a lot of libraries have that. It allows you to, to download eBooks and audiobooks wherever you happen to be. It's fantastic. Um, on top of that, a lot of people get caught up on the gear and there there are a lot of things i i carry a packed one bag which is a brand p-a-k-t that i really like um i've used bags by e-bags that are fantastic i have all sorts of clothing that i wear that i know last and looks generic enough that people don't notice if i wear it over and over again I would advise though in most cases don't get caught up on the specifics of the gear that you're carrying go travel a little bit, try some things out, see what you're missing, see what you took that you don't need. Most of us will take more stuff that we don't need than leave stuff behind that we do need. Focus on the essentials, just have the toiletries, have any medications that you need, you know, bring a book or a Kindle or your phone, something to entertain yourself with in between on long journeys. But beyond that, don't get too fixated on the stuff because the stuff, I could recommend something that works great for me, it won't necessarily work great for you and your priorities, the way you like to travel, your aesthetic sensibilities. That's something that you'll figure out over time. And even if you travel with something that at first you feel looks stupid or doesn't work perfectly, that's kind of part of the process of winnowing in on something that will ultimately serve you long term. And it's just a matter of then going through that and rifling through it and cycling through it over time. It's a non-answer, I know, but like that's the most honest answer I think I can give. Well said. Okay, next question. Uh, what age group were you addressing in your blog, Exile Lifestyle? Oh, all ages. Um, but interestingly, actually, uh, like I, I don't look at a whole lot of audience demographic information online. I, I don't do ads, so I don't have to have that stuff collected. But um, what I tend to find is it's a lot of people who are at the beginning of adulthood. So it's people who are older teens, young 20s, but then also people who are 50s and older. And, and I think 
the reason for that, a lot of the stuff that I talk about is finding yourself and stoking creativity and figuring out ways to continue to grow as a person, whatever your circumstances, and to continue to learn and to pursue things just for the sake of pursuing them, that sort of thing. And people who are in those age demographics are either the very beginning of being able to explore some of those things, or they're at the next step in their life in which they're looking for a kind of revivification revivification of the same thing after a period of maybe having more uh, responsibilities that kept them locked into a certain way of doing things or preconceived notions that they had to live in a particular way. And now they're just starting to have that Grand Canyon moment where they're looking at things from the big picture for whatever reason and rethinking the way that they might build their life. And one of the best things about the work that I do and having that blog and doing the other stuff that I do is having people write to me from all over the world and getting to hear what they're up to at that moment. And the vast majority of the emails that I receive include some information about whatever pivot point they're at in their life at that moment. And so I think whatever the age demographic, because there's people of all ages, but whatever the age demo, it tends to be people who are looking down multiple paths and they're trying to figure out where they want to go and who they want to be as they're traversing that next portion of the trail. All right. Um, did you have any language issues while you were traveling? I know you touched on Google Translate being wildly helpful, but is there anything else you would recommend? Yeah, practicing. Um, I'm I say it like that because I'm terrible at languages. And I've had I've had to pick up a fair I, I can babble convincingly if you don't know much about the language in like 12 languages, but I'm not saying anything intelligent. The the only language I can really speak properly is English and a bit more than that Spanish, but I speak it with a Castellano accent. So anybody outside of Argentina thinks I don't know what I'm doing, uh, which is totally fair because I actually don't really. I, I would encourage you um, to just practice and to have a resource like Mango Languages, something like that, that you work on over time leading up to your trip to a place where they speak a different language that you're not familiar with. And while you are there, doing it beforehand, if you're able to, will give you a firm baseline of some of the basic things like hello, thank you. Learning how to say yeah is surprisingly useful any place you might go, because then you can just nod and go yeah, and people will think you know what's happening. Um, things like that you can pick up, learn to count to 10, um, yes, no, all of these things. Learn those fundamentals, but then you'll learn a lot more once you get there because suddenly you have skin in the game and you can go out into the world and learning to correctly say cheese croissant means the difference between getting what you want and what you don't want at the bakery down the street. And it, it's really a, a remarkable trans transition from everything being theoretical to everything being pract practical. And I would just say, take the most advantage of that you possibly can when you are in situ. And for a lot of people, the passion then continues later because they're like, oh man, that was so much fun. And suddenly I have all of these words for things that don't exist or at least not properly in English. That then allows you to see different things, different aspects of the world and yourself as well. All right. Uh, really popular question was um you have a list of favorite places you've visited or favorite things you've done and what is your top foodie destination oh well okay the foodie one's easy um i lived in calcutta in india for a while and i gained five pounds i i have not dramatically shifted in weight one way or the other since i was like in my early 20s i'm 38 now um, I gained five pounds when I was in Calcutta because the food is just astonishingly good and terrible for you. It's, just, it's really, really bad for you, but so delicious and inexpensive uh, if you're spending U.S. dollars. So dangerous place to live uh, if you are into food and don't want to gain five pounds. Uh, beyond that, though, favorites I always struggle with because there's so many different types of favorite. There's, you know, favorite places to learn certain things, favorite places to go because it's chilled out favorite place to go because it's difficult, but in a valuable way. My favorite place in terms of atmosphere, and I say that in terms of the weather, but also the aesthetic sensibility and the culture and everything else is probably Iceland. Um, I've lived in Reykjavik several times, and there's a term, an Icelandic term, glukabetar, that means window weather. That's the direct translation. And what it refers to is the type of weather that is great to look at through a window. 
and you absolutely would not want to be in it, but it's so much fun and so beautiful just to look at it. And a lot of ice, the Icelandic climate, the, the nature and the environment there is very glukavetr related weather. Um, I love sitting in a little stone concrete home, very dense, very well insulated in Reykjavik. You can see the wind, you can see the water and the storm is blustering outside and everything is terrible. And you can go outside periodically just to remind yourself what you're missing out on. But then you come back inside and all of the homes are heated using geothermal heat um, from all the seismic activity underground. So it's a nice continuous little warmth that you have permeating everything you do. That, that is my absolute favorite place to sit and write about difficulties I have elsewhere because there's not a lot of difficulties in Reykjavik. All right. Um, do you have any recommendations for how to find um, good cheap restaurants, where to find cool things to do in your city or outside of it, et cetera? Yeah. So <clears throat> to a certain degree, you can get pretty far using Google Maps. It, it pains me to say it because it's so generic and everybody uses it already. But if, you, if you're willing to put in the time and don't necessarily trust the reviews, you can find some interesting little niche out of the way places. My favorite way to do it though, and the most reliable one, and it's my favorite for a couple of reasons, which I'll get into in a second, is to just talk to somebody who lives in that area. And it can be really simple. I usually do it with somebody that I'm having a quick engagement with where they have to talk to me. So I'm, I'm getting gas at the gas station or I'm getting a coffee at the coffee shop. And I'll just say, hey, I'm in town. I don't know anything about this place. What's your favorite place to eat? Or, or where do you take people when they're visiting? And then almost always they will be thrilled to tell you, one, because they are getting to give their opinion about something and we love to give our opinions about things, but also they get to help somebody. They get to show off something about their town. They get to make sure they have a good experience. More than once I've actually had people invite me to go out to eat with them or in a few cases to go eat at their home, which was unusual and great. Um, one of those cases, we did not speak any of the same language and yet somehow we made it work. I just followed as they gestured and then ate what they told me to eat. Uh, you probably won't have that experience everywhere you go, but almost always you will get some pretty good rec recommendations. Uh, and then occasionally, like 5% of the time, a truly hilariously, entertainingly tragic recommendation, which can also be fun. All right. Um, what else do we have? Uh, do you have any recommendations for travel problems like jet lag or anxiety? Is that anything you struggle with? And what are your best tips? Yeah, so anxiety in general, um, especially a lot of people get this with plane travel. And I know everything with Boeing being in the news recently, that doesn't help that kind of anxiety. Um, but statistically, reminding myself that I am safer in a plane than I am in a car and I get in a car every, well, not every day. I get in a car semi-regularly without even thinking about it. That helps me a little bit. Uh, and then also when I'm on the plane, looking out the window, looking at the machinery, allowing myself to experience awe that we as a species have figured out how to do this. And on a casual, regular basis, all day, every day, we've got heavier than air vehicles flying around the sky that rapidly. And it's available that relatively inexpensively for what amounts to wizardry, I try to remind myself of that too. And I can usually then get caught up in the awe, even if there's a bunch of turbulence or something. Uh, what, what was the other part of that question? Jet lag. Jet lag. Oh, um, typically what I do, and it's, I'm unfortunately it's imperfect, but what works the best for me of all the things I've tried is adjusting my eating schedule the day before I'm going to a new place for the eating schedule and the place I'm going, because that helps with your routine and your perception of routine a little bit, but importantly, it also helps with your blood sugar. And that then tends to tweak the knob on all of the other things that you're doing, including just when your energetic levels arrive throughout the day. Good recommendation. <laughs> um, do you do a lot of research before going on trips normally, or do you wing it? When do you use one or the other if you use both? Typically, I prefer to wing it. And part of the reason for that, I, I actually, for a lot of what I do for a living these days, I research professionally. So my tendency is to research things in general. But when I travel, I like to go to a place with as close to a clean slate as I can possibly have. So I don't have a bunch of preconceived notions about what it's going to be or what I should expect of it. That way, 
for me at least, it makes it easier for me to take whatever happens and to roll with it rather than trying to force something that could become a really cool adventure onto a particular path that I was expecting, that it needed to be a particular way or it's going to be this way. Otherwise, everything else is being compared to that pre-assessment of what it should be. Um, so you could do it either way. And in some cases, especially if you're going to a place for a very short period of time and you don't feel super comfortable asking people in situ what you should do and trying to find adventures once you get there, if you don't trust that something will happen that you'll enjoy, it doesn't hurt to look into something. And it also doesn't hurt to have, typically I'll have a, a motive end loci, like something that I am kind of sort of headed toward. It's my excuse to go to an area, especially when I'm taking a road trip or something. But then if I don't end up going to that thing, it's okay. But bare minimum, worst case scenario, I get to go visit the Nutcracker Museum in this particular town or something like that. And that's my fallback plan. But I'm also then allowing myself to consider other stuff and to try to uh, allow life to happen to me on my way to the Nutcracker Museum. I really like that. Um, another question about um, health and safety. So have you ever encountered a dangerous situation or like a really big health scare? I know in one of your books, you talk about a health scare you had at one point, I think you got some sort of flu. Um, Dengue fever. Yeah, expand on that a little bit and how you dealt yeah. with it. Yeah, um, so in Thailand, uh, there was a big, Dengue was going around um, and they call it breakneck fever. It is incredibly painful. Uh, somebody that I know actually while I was there died of it because you can, if you take the wrong painkiller when you get dengue, you can accidentally cause hemorrhagic dengue and start bleeding internally. So stuff like that can happen. Um, if I had been <laughs> better informed about it, I, I n knew tangentially that dengue was a thing. I didn't realize what was happen happening to me initially, and I lucked out buying the correct painkiller at the 7-Eleven down the street from my apartment. So, you know, so, sometimes things just happen that turn out okay. Um, often they typically will um, turn out okay one way or another. But my usual way of dealing with that sort of thing, because I've had some other things happen as well. I've, I've got had some people try to mug me when I was living in Buenos Aires. Um, you do what you can with the local resources because you can't prepare for everything. Violence can happen to you anywhere you go. Um, like people were warning me about Buenos Aires when, before I went there. I looked up the crime statistics there. I had more chance of being mugged where I was living at the time in Los Angeles than I did in Buenos Aires. It's just that fears overseas associated with people who might look different and architecture that looks different and places where they speak weird languages, that seems more viscerally terrifying because of that unfamiliarity. But things, most places you'll go in the world, with some exceptions, but most places you go, there will be clinics, there will be hospitals, there will be police. Um, so you'll, you'll tend to respond to those things you, the way you would anywhere else. You won't necessarily have insurance that will work, but often it will be cheaper because our healthcare system in the United States is incredibly pricey uh, for what you pay for. But uh, almost always you can kind of just do what makes sense in those situations and you'll be fine. On rare occasions, if there's something that's really stand out that you're terrified about, you can make a plan of what you do if something like that happens. If I get mugged, I've got this spare wad of cash and an expired gym membership in my pocket. I hand that to the mugger, walk away, I've still got my ID. Um, if I catch this disease, here's the hospital I'm going to go to. If I start to feel anything that feels like dengue, I'm going to this place. You can make those sorts of plans. If it helps, you almost certainly won't need them. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have like a compiled resource of travel books or websites or organizations that you find useful? No, I probably should though. Um, Truth be told, I actually don't read a lot of travel books or anything like that. I think they're great. And the ones that I have read, I've enjoyed. It's just that I, I read a lot more fiction. And then the nonfiction that I read tends to be on a particular topic that I'm trying to understand. So reading about other people's travel experiences doesn't hit the same spot for me as traveling myself. Um, that said, there's a lot of great stuff out there. And I, I hear there's a lot of travel books at your local library too. So um, <laughs> there, there's probably some excellent resources that you can search by keyword and topic when you go to such an establishment. Great answer. Um, okay, we'll finish up 
with a couple more questions. Uh, do you bring back anything from your travels? Do you have any mementos that you collect or anything like that? Typically, no. Um, and part of that is that most of my travel career at this point, my travel lifestyle has been living out of a carry-on bag. So I just didn't have the real estate for anything, even if I did want to take something. Um, I also, though, so I'm like, I'm a minimalist philosophically, and I try to focus on the most vital stuff in my life so I can spend more time, energy, and resources on those things. And that tends to carry over to the stuff that I have as well. And to me, the most valuable aspect of travel is not necessarily taking something with me to remind myself of it, but to try to be there enough when I'm in the moment that I've got it all up here. And, you know, so there'll be some photos and stuff as well. And sometimes those can trigger memories and, and floods of qualia that otherwise I wouldn't have been able to easily summon to mind. But uh, usually my policy when I travel is to try to be in the moment enough that that's all I have to take home, just the memories of being there. And that then frees up more money as well to spend on experiential stuff rather than thinking, well, which mementos or tchotchkes could I take? Uh, but it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with that. And especially stuff that's unique to the situation or made by somebody or something, you know, a stone from a beach or something like that, that can be very meaningful if your stuff is more imbued with that sort of experiential value for you than it is for me. All right. And we'll wrap up with... Just one last question um, on a high note. Can you share with us your most memorable travel experience and what made it special? Oh, gosh. Most memorable. Or one of. Yeah. You know, so there was a period. And part of the reason that it stands out is that it was one of the first. The first place that I went after I left the United States, people voted on where I should go to Argentina. Uh, I lived in Buenos Aires for three of the four months that I spent there. And then the last month I spent traveling around the country in the colectivos, in the long distance buses, which the Argentine bus system is great. Uh, don't know how it's doing right now. Their economy is not great at the moment, but typically very, very good buses. So I traveled all around the country and then I ended up arriving down at the very southern tip, a place called Ushuaia, which is a port town. And it's one of the just couple of ports where ships leave and they embark and disembark to go to Antarctica. And so I, I spent the holidays one year there, hanging out in a hostel in Ushuaia, wandering around. The, all of the city streets are incredibly sloped, like at a degree, at a grade that would not be legal in the United States. It's exhausting. It, it was exhausting just getting back to the hostel each day because it was a bit far away from the dock where the dock was the lowest point. Um, but there's a place or there was a place at the time, at least in Ushuaia uh, called Dublin, which is the southernmost Irish pub in the world. And it's where all the captains of these boats go to hang out with each other and to find people to work on their ship. And it's something that you don't usually hear about till you get there. But when you get there, the rumor mill is murmuring about this. If you go to Dublin at the right time and buy enough green beer, which they sell year round for the right captain, they will hire you to clean the deck of the ship and give you free room and board down to Antarctica, which is otherwise a very expensive trip. So I spent with somebody else at the hostel, this other person, this friend that I had made, we went there every night for a week and attempting to get one of these coveted spots, swabbing the deck aboard one of these ships to Antarctica. But it turns out that we arrived like a day too late. And a group of people had arrived right before we did. They took the last of the positions. So all we did was basically go in, buy a bunch of green beer for a bunch of captains that made it seem as if they still had spots for us to get the beer. And they didn't. And it was just, it was a wonderful experience. It was a weird little lead up to Christmas that year. And it was a great bond building experience with the other people who are trying to do the same thing in a very strange part of the world. All right. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> so for all of the other questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, um, Colin's email is available on his website. He might be able to throw this slide up with his email or website information. Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. If you know not, what? I can probably type it into the thing. That would work. Bring up too. the chat here. It's just Colin at exilelifestyle.com. Please do feel free to reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. Uh, 
so that's in the chat. I'll see if Robert can put that in the email tomorrow. Um, but we are going to wrap up. So I'd like to thank the friends of the library one more time, our partnering libraries, the audience, and most importantly, Colin. Thank you very much for a wonderful evening and a great presentation. Thank you so um, much for having me. This was a real blast. Of course. All right. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.